This is Duke University. Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is Malachi Cohen. I'm chair of the Council for European Studies. Um, and we have uh, two distinguished guests from Vienna with us uh, this afternoon who came for the session on Vienna, a global city, to the conference on global cities organized by the Duke Middle Eastern Studies uh, Center in collaboration with the Center for European Studies. Uh, the first guest on my right is Dr. Wolfgang Madertanner, who's the head of the Austrian State Archives. And on his right is Professor Andreas Weigel from the University of Vienna. And the major theme, the major point of the Vienna session was to emphasize the importance of history and memory, deep local histories and local memories for the construction of global uh, cities. Vienna began as the capital of an empire, became the capital of a small nation state, and is becoming again, right now, a global city, a major regional metropolis. In the process, it went in the interwar period through a Red Vienna, becoming a world socialist center, and then went through the National Socialist trauma, through a period of being on the outskirts of Europe, and now becoming again, as Professor Andreas Weigel uh, will show us, a new regional metropolis. So uh, perhaps we can start with you, uh, uh, doc Dr. Madotaner, and perhaps you can tell us something about the global significance of Red Vienna, of Socialist Vienna, between the two world wars. Well, thank you, Malachi. Uh, to begin with, uh, what made Vienna important, what made Vienna glorious, what made Vienna a global city was uh, its uh, cultural innovations uh, around the turn of the centuries, from the 19th to the 20th century. And uh, uh, all of us know about, uh, say, uh, Arthur Schnitzlaus, Kokuschka, uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, Wittgenstein, Schnitzler, and, and, and the like. You know, this, These were um, cultural innovation of a global significance. Uh, then Vienna went through the trauma of the First World War, the Great War, and uh, uh, a highly praised metropolis, an ever-flourishing uh, metropolis, imperial metropolis, uh, was being transformed into uh, the capital of a small state, of an unwanted, widely unwanted small state in the center of Europe. So the city acquired, uh, within a few years, uh, markedly and uh, astonishingly different uh, social, cultural and political status. And this was the status of the social. Uh, Vienna was being destituted. Vienna uh, was a dying city in the immediate post-World War I period. So what uh, was being done was uh, kind of, uh, you nowadays would uh, level it, uh, biopolitics and the politics of space. That is, a program of communal housing was set up that was unique and was uh, marvelous and made Vienna uh, widely known as uh, the social capital of Europe. This is quite wonderful. Can you tell us something perhaps about the architecture of uh, Red Vienna, the shaping of urban, of urban space, its significance for the socialist experiment and its, its global reputation? Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, truly enlightened and modern project. That means uh, Vienna began a building program and from 1923 to 1933 some 65,000 apartments were being built that is uh, living space for 11 percent of the entire city population and uh, these were not simply uh, Social house, uh, social houses, or, or some, w whatever you you might call them. These were modern, rational, urban implants that displayed a logic of their own. But at the same time, they were communicating 
were communicating and uh, taking up a dialogue with the historical urban matrix, uh, leading modern architects, co all coming from the school of Otto Wagner, um, leading architects uh, that um, have quite a reputation even nowadays in the United States, like Adolf Loos or Grete Schütte-Lihotsky. They were conceiving of a program of uh, urban social housing that was in fact unique and these were so-called superblocks and the superblocks were allowed only to occupy um, um, 30 to 40 percent maximum of the respective building sites and uh, were equipped with uh, facilities for uh, communal and leisure activities for children's care, for mother's care, for uh, old age provision, for uh, they were con they were <coughs> endowed with uh, uh, courtyards and and and, uh, and gardens, and uh, they were really uh, a new kind of um, of uh, uh, they set a new kind of living standard for the working population. It's, uh, in, in German, it's, it, there's a term Volkswohnungspalast that means palaces for the people. Well, it's wonderful. How, how did these palaces end? <laughs> well, uh, uh, the, the, the onset of the economic depression uh, very soon set an end to the communal experiment. I mean, from 1929 onwards, the, uh, the urban uh, economy as well as the economy of the whole country was hit very very badly and uh, and uh, on the onset of the crisis uh, just meant an end to the communal experiment and uh, the Vienna municipality ended in a, a, a financial disaster that was being caused by the global financial crisis and uh, in 1933 when there was one of the last uh, blocks uh, uh, being opened uh, by the Lord Mayor, by uh, Karl Seitz. Karl Seitz said Vienna is going to be a stronghold of uh, liberty and the bulwark against fascism, uh, as it always has been, uh, and Seitz proved uh, to be wrong, wrong. because uh, uh, the, the immediate social and cultural uh, results uh, of the crisis uh, did away with uh, democracy. First, with the with the civil with the civil war and the construction of the Ständerstaat, the corporate states, and then the uh, National Socialist come in 1938 with the Anschluss with the, with German indeed, and that's the that's the end of of, of Red Vienna. In the post-war period, uh, posters, election posters for the Socialist Party called called to vote for the Socialist Party so that Wien will again become Weltstadt, a world metropolis. But not too many people believe before 1989 that Vienna will become again a world metropolis. Isn't it so, Professor yeah, Weigel? Absolutely. Uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the period of reconstructing uh, Austria after World War II, uh, people and politicians, of course, uh, politicians in, in, in the city, uh, have just to reconstruct and rebuild the city because of the bombings and the war, and it was not a, a, a big topic uh, how to how is the status of the city uh, compared with uh, the history of the of, of the let's say of the Habsburg time or of the interwar period, but later on there were some uh, beginning in the 60s and 70s some attempts to. Uh, to improve the status to, for instance, uh, Vienna became in 1979 the official third uh, uh, UN city uh, and uh, there was some nostalgic revival in the 1980s, but it was not really a serious discussion. Uh, what are we, how is our status? Uh, but things changed after the magic year of 1989, as we all know. And uh, despite uh, some very skeptical views in the early 90, 1990s, where uh, e economists, uh, social scientists uh, blamed uh, the situation, they, they thought 
it would be an, a, a competition with the new EU member uh, brother states, which Vienna is not uh, in, a, in, in a shape to, to, to compete with them uh, because of the long time on the uh, decades uh, in a uh, kind of safe um, economy at the end of the Western world, at the eastern end of the Western world. Uh, but uh, if we look now, uh, 25 years uh, have uh, had passed, and uh, there are some uh, there's some evidence, some uh, figures that show us that uh, history matters, of course, and uh, especially in the field of uh, external economic relations, uh, we can see uh, ties from the past still matter. There are uh, uh, huge shares of the Austrian external trade uh, with uh, the uh, neighboring countries, the former uh, successor states of the monarchy, uh, and investments uh, from Austrian uh, companies. Uh, furthermore, not to forget uh, banks and insurance companies who were very uh, offensive in trying to uh, to settle down in these new transforming economies. And managed to do so. Uh, managed to do so, despite this backslash of 2008 that we all know, but they are still present uh, in a very prominent way. So all directions lead to, v to Vienna from, from, the, from the previous successor states of the monarchy. It appears like there is a resurrection of imperial, imperial uh, networks, economic networks. And I understand that also immigration pattern somehow tend to come back just the way they were before. Could you tell us something about yeah. that? Uh, it's not only the economy, it's the uh, migratory movements uh, too. Uh, that uh, especially after the turn of the uh, new century in, in 2000 and the following years um, showed uh, uh, a massive increase in the growth rates, in the demographic growth rates, uh, uh, because of immigration, immigration to Vienna, uh, not only from the success, former successor states, from uh, Western European countries too, from the guest, so-called guest worker countries, uh, the ex-Yugoslavian countries and Turkey too, but uh, it shows a, no, a new dynamic which is quite uh, interesting and um, uh, it's, it's not, uh, you, we are not wrong if we say there is something uh, in this uh, dynamic which is shows some similarities to the um, dynamic, uh, even economic uh, mm -hmm. and migratory uh, movement of the late monarchy. If you think of the years of 1900 to 1913 mm -hmm. and the movement from, for instance, Galicia or Bukovina or other parts of the uh, yeah. monarchy to the capital city. This is so interesting because it would seem then that there is something like deep historical knowledge, which is local knowledge, that is somehow not available to multinationals. Yeah. And it's so, so a, a global city in some ways relies on the limits of globalization, on some, ta on some type of deep local structures and local knowledge, so it would appear. Yeah, uh, I think uh, this is a, a theory that describes this, uh, the importance of this local knowledge, this informal knowledge, uh, pretty well is the uh, concept of institutions uh, uh, elaborated by Douglas C. North and others uh, in, in economic history, but there are, you can extend this uh, institutional uh, theory not only uh, uh, in the field of economics, you can say to social relations, mm -hmm. to uh, cultural uh, relations and uh, similar fields. Wonderful. So it would appear Vienna indeed made again a contribution to our understandings of global cities. Uh, Dr. Mado Tanner, uh, Professor Weigel, thank you so much for being with us. Come and visit us again and we will visit you in Vienna. Okay. <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Wonderful.